So hello and good afternoon, and at least to those of you who are in the United States. Um, my name is Jennifer Murtazashvili, and I'm the director of the Center for of Governance and Markets here at the University of Pittsburgh. It is a huge delight to welcome Professor Karen Barkey, uh, who's here with us today. She is the Haas Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. She's also currently the director of the Center for the Study of Democracy, Toleration, and Religion there. Her work on the comparative and historical study of the state has had an enormous impact on so many of us. Her, uh, Professor Barkey is currently pursuing a range of different projects on religion and toleration. She's written extensively on the early centuries of Ottoman state uh, consolidation and is now exploring different ways of understanding how religious coexistence, toleration and sharing occurred in different historical sites under Ottoman rule. Her presentation today the socio-historical conditions of sharing sacred sites, reflections on contemporary cases across the Mediterranean, presents this work in progress. And I should say that for us here at the Center for Governance and Markets, this is a very special event because there we have a group of us here working on a research initiative focused on coexistence in pluralistic society. And this initiative seeks to explore the different ways individuals and communities devise rules to live with deep differences around the world. And so if you're interested in being part of this research community, please do send me a note and I will be sure to find a way to include you in our work going forward. So without further ado, Professor Barkey, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for the introduction and the, uh, the invitation. I hope that my work will be a small contribution to the issues of coexistence in plural societies. I'm very much involved in understanding those cases of co where coexistence is possible and where people of different religions with deep difference, as you say, live together, work together and negotiate their otherness. My next book is on pluralism in the Mediterranean, a research project on three analytic levels, imperial, state level, urban networks level and institutional level, and then the micro level of shared sacred sites. So today I'll talk about shared sacred sites. Uh, let me dive in. Shared sacred sites are holy for members of multiple religious group and groups and serve not only as space, places where people respect and visit uh, in various ways, but also as places where they mediate and they negotiate their otherness. Uh, they are perfect examples of what in sociology a prominent scholar has called lived religion and advocates the study of lived religion by focusing on practice. Um, these sites have been customary between Jews, Christians, and Muslims in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, and they're also very much customary across the various cultures of Eastern and Southeastern Asian countries. This sharing is not an insignificant phenomenon. For the Ottoman Empire, the British archeologist Frederick Hasluck traveled and made observations from 1905 to 1915 that are compiled in two volumes, Christianity and Islam, a rich account of religious sites, churches, monasteries, tekkes, mosques, caves, um, sacred springs, where different faith communities prayed and interacted with each other. Um, if you put up the map, Sophia, uh, as you can see, uh, as you can see in the map, yes, thank you very much. Um, there are numerous uh, sites that were shared in the Ottoman Empire, and many of them are still shared by Christian and Christians and Muslims in the Balkans and Anatolia. This map is actually a partial map. It doesn't take into account all of the sites that are in the Arab uh, regions of the empire. Now, if you look at the map of the Mediterranean today, the next map, um, just the sites that my colleagues 
uh, Dionigi Albera and Manuel Penico uh, and I visited and researched and included in our shared sacred sites exhibitions, again, you will see that this number is not insignificant and that they continued in our exhibits 29 sites, but like cities like Istanbul, for example, have many different sites. So it's a lot more than that. In fact, today we have prepared a list that of the Middle East and the Mediterranean that is more than 100 shared sites, small and large, and with various levels of visitation. So you can see that this is not a, an insignificant phenomenon. In, especially in the 21st century, when nation states and not empires are the unit of governance with nationalist agendas, and when from reading the newspapers, you would think that the three monotheistic religions are at constant war with each other. Um, so these, hundred sites or, you know, most of these sites are places where people live uh, in, uh, in peaceful sharing agreements with each other, with varying choreographies, and I will talk about that. Apart from the fact that I would uh, rather do an ethnography of a pilgrimage in Bukada or on, live on Crete for a while, uh, then sit in dusty archives collecting tax documents or land tenure documents like I used to do. Um, why are these sites so important? They are examples, first of all, of successful cohabitation in religious sanctuaries. And as such, we as a team of wor working scholars working together are committed to publicizing these cases through website, museum exhibits, feature length movies, et cetera, and to counter the journalistic accounts and provide alternative narratives of religious coexistence. And then secondly, as scholars, they are also test sites for us to study the choreographies of sharing, the networks that bring people together, uh, the mechanisms by which people negotiate coexistence, the narratives that they tell, the stories, the cultural tropes that fa facilitate sharing. We want then to understand the conditions for the emergence as well as the maintenance of these shared sacred spaces that persevere despite increasing homogeneity and majoritarian domination today. So let's go to the examples and I'll go through very fast through a few examples. Um, most of them are places where I, I worked myself and did ethnography. The Greek Orthodox churches of Istanbul, mostly shared by Christians and Muslims and a little bit by Jews. The first one is the Mother of God Church at Vefa. It's also called the First of the Month Church because um, uh, there is a pilgrimage to this, uh, to this church by Muslims and Christians and all kinds of tourists, etc. every first of the month. The church fills up and there is a whole ritual that people uh, follow. If you can go to the next slide, um, there is praying at the outside, at the entrance of the church. Next, uh, praying, uh, buying candles, and actually also keys, and praying uh, in front of the icon of Mary, and then actually waiting uh, to be blessed by the priest. As, and as you can see, everybody is waiting outside. And the next uh, slide, people staying afterwards to talk, to chat, to create community. Um, next, um, this is a uh, St. George Monastery, uh, a postcard of it, uh, in Bukada, which is an island off the coast of Istanbul. You will see next an old uh, picture, photog photograph of the 
of the pilgrimage to this monastery in its earlier form as it was very in very dilapidated condition then it became it got reconstructed rebuilt and next pictures will show that um, so the tradition in this uh, in this uh, 23rd of April, when people come to this monastery, Muslims, Jews, uh, tourists, uh, Christians of all uh, denominations, you are supposed to monastery in silence while, while you're unspooling reds, and then come to the monastery, light candles, Next slide, please. Light candles and move uh, into the monastery for prayers and blessings again. And then you exit the monastery and then you make wishes. You write wishes, you put them on trees, etc. You also make uh, little designs, next slide, of, um, uh, of your wishes with sugar cubes that you leave there for the next you know, few days they stay there and the wishes are supposed to come true. And then you can see in the next picture, the beauty of the place and these uh, young Muslim women who are taking a break from prayers at the monastery with this beautiful view. Next um, is the uh, Church of Saint Antoine in Istanbul. Uh, Let's go through quickly the slides. People pray, Muslim and Christian women praying together to the statue of Saint Antoine, then writing wishes uh, at uh, the church. Uh, now I go to, to Tunisia, Muslim uh, in uh, the Griba synagogue at Jerba, which is a little island. And here it's a synagogue that was established a very long time ago and where Jews and Muslims come for pilgrimages and daily visits uh, regularly. And they pray together. And you can see that the Muslim and the wo Jewish woman really do exactly the same thing here. They're praying in front of the, of the tablets of the Torah. Um, then you go to the, uh, oh, sorry, fertility ritual at Jerba. The women then go into a cave with their, with eggs that they bring in where they've written their wishes for a child and they deposit the egg there for fertility. I move on to Etz Haim. Etz Haim is a synagogue in Crete that I worked uh, for, for a while, where I worked for a while. Um, Etz Haim was destroyed during the Nazi uh, invasion of Greece and no one really remained, uh, Jews did not remain in the island. But years later, the Nikos Stavroulakis, the rabbi of Etz Haim came back and uh, he had been a kid when he was uh, when his parents were were uh, taken by the Nazis, and then um, he rebuilt the synagogue and opened it to everyone. So Shabbat services include uh, Muslims and Christians and Jews, everyone that comes to Crete. Next slide. Um, these are uh, just people tying colorful banners to for wishes again. And the next slide is the rabbi that I worked with, uh, who we lost a couple of years ago. Um, let's go to Muslim shrines and I'll be finished in a minute with the examples. Um, Durbaliteke is in Larissa, Greece. And Durbaliteke is shared by Muslims, Greeks, and Albanians. And here at the entrance of the Teke, you can already see uh, pictures of Ali and then pictures of saints put together. The Durbalu Sheikh on the other side, so mixed imagery. And again, at the entrance as we move in, uh, at the entrance of the Turbe, where the Sheikh is uh, buried at the mausoleum, you have both a Christian altar and Christian images, as well as Muslims. So you see the interchange. The Muslims go inside the Turbe, Christians pray outside the Turbe. 
Uh, finally, one more, just to give you more diversity. Sveti Nikola in Macedonia. This is a day of Muslim prayer. And you can see that there is again Ali and there's an icon, a Christian icon and the Muslim Sheikh is, is um, praying. Uh, on the day of the Orthodox pilgrimage, the St. George, the St. George pilgrimage, the place is prepared for Christians. That means covering Ali, uh, co taking away, you know, the Muslim objects, materials, leaving it for Christians only. And the next day, right away, reassembling this mixed um, where everyone comes during the day, both Christians and Muslims for special. Uh, most. So we can stop here um, and I can go back if you want to stop sharing. These are the examples I wanted to give. Um, lived religion, um, and I want to two minutes talk about the kind of theoretical and then analyze. I'm very much influenced here by Nancy Ammerman of Boston College, who thinks about this as lived religion and practice. And in this practice, she says, there's a routinized type of behavior which consists of several elements interconnected to one another, bodily activities, mental activities, things, objects, a background knowledge, a form of understanding, emotions, um, narratives of, of what you're doing, etc. Bourdieu, as we know, uh, also adds to practice the element of power and status, and he talks about habitus, and there is certainly a habitus in here. And then the pragmatist approach will bring habitus and habits and creativity, and I want to put that into the mix as well. So when I say that I'm looking at the shared sacred spaces, uh, as patterned regularities, I want to understand those patterns, see how they are meaningful within the context, but I want to look both at the patterns of action and also the patterns of relations. When we talk of action, it's those rituals, the prayers, the gestures that people engage in. They represent a base knowledge of how to act, for example, in a Greek Orthodox church or a Muslim shrine. And the knowledge gets reproduced through performance and imitation. Those who do not know when they come in are initiated either by being taught or by simply imitating what those who know are doing. Uh, when we talk about relations, I'm much more interested in the social, religious, economic, and political bases of the relationships between people who attend these spaces. Here, the relations with the other, uh, the narratives of participation, the links that they establish that move outside of the sanctuary tell us a lot about why people do this, why they, um, they join. Um, friendship, empathy, devotion, tolerance, economic gain, political claim making. This is all of the varied, you know, um, rainbow of things that is possible. Uh, so what is it that creates all of this? How, what is, is it the, the practice alone or the practice and the social relations that emerge and the narratives that are told? Um, this is what I want to, in a sense, unpack today, knowing that there is also the state, there is also all of the larger macro political variables, but I don't have time to talk about them. So think about them, but, and we can talk in the question part. To say two things about the historical antecedents because they're very important. One is the biblical understanding of sharing. We know that in a crucial episode of the, uh, that is related both in the Bible and the Quran, um, Abraham is said to have hosted with open arms the mysterious, three mysterious visitors, inviting them for a meal with him under the 
Oak of Amamre, where he lived. The act of welcoming the visitors indicates that the acceptance of the foreigner as a central theme of Abrahamic faith. But then we also need, and that's really important, we also need to understand the movement of empires, the phenomenal mobility of peoples, of conquest, of expansion, and the inability of land-based traditional empires to impose sameness therefore being open to diversity and having to figure out a kind of management of diversity um, that is useful at first and becomes a form of you know, top-down and bottom-up toleration, which I wrote about in, in a prior work, but then becomes because it becomes successful. I do not need to spend more time on this, but I want to flag that what is really crucial about and what helps us understand the emergence of these traditions is that in a sense, in a fascinating way, the early centuries of encounter between heterodoxy, uh, between, sorry, the Christians and the Muslims are moments are also centuries of heterodoxy of heretical movements, of dualist splintering in Christianity and in Islam. So when across the border, whether it's during the Seljuk Empire, the end of the Byzantine or the Ottoman or in Al-Andalus, you know, when there is this meeting of the two religions, it's not just these very fixed traditions that meet each other. Instead, it's all kinds of antinomian ways of thinking, heretical ways of thinking that have influenced all these people and their, their meeting, in a sense, is more open. So having said that, I'm now going to jump to the contemporary cases. I need to do a little history to, to feel good. So. In the contemporary case, you know, many of the historical spaces of joint worship have been maintained through changes and have pre been preserved as shared sites until today. They survived centuries, they survived wars, they survived the transformation of empire to national states multiple regime changes from communism to democratic rule to more authoritarian rule to majoritarian regimes of today. Um, therefore, they reflect for me a big puzzle. How is it that in contemporary, in the contemporary world with nationalism, with religious nationalism, with mobilized identities, can these places continue to flourish? So that's the question. Uh, to go back to one of the examples, the, the case of Saint Antoine in the, in the Pera district of Istanbul, you can see the continuity. It's superb. A chapel named Saint Antoine of Padua existed in the Kasım Pasha district of Istanbul in the 17th century. And at the same time, there was another church and hospital complex dedicated to the to again to Saint Antoine by the city walls near the water. And it served as a important pilgrimage site for Christians, for Catholics, Orthodox, Greek, Armenians, etc., and Muslims who went there to pray every Saturday evening when the priest would read from the gospel and dab the sacred oil on the congregants for healing their ills. This place was closed down and confiscated in 1640 because it was a much more uh, extreme Sunni funda fundamentalist mo mo moment in the Ottoman Empire. And then it reopened um, in 1724. And through changes, it the last one, which I work at, was opened in 1912. So what? should we gather from all of this? And I'll talk about a few points and then close up. First of all, I think contemporary sharing happens within a historical cultural habitus 
long established through Byzantine Ottoman relations and further. It also happens within a political context, and I'll talk about it a bit later. We see the effect of a long standing cultural and religious symbiosis, a society that has for many centuries had a high level of Muslim Christian interaction and has developed certain ritual practices which are not fully syncretic, but where symbols have been absorbed, exchanged, merged, and where there hasn't been a complete merging of religious traditions, but knowledge that has been exchanged. Together, uh, so many visitors come to these sites because their ancestors came, their immediate grandparents came, family members came. And together they produce a romanticized version of the past, um, selectively mining Istanbul's history to provide useful models for people today. Especially when you talk to people in small groups, you see that they a moral past, one where religions between uh, relations between religious and ethnic groups uh, were better, where they were less constrained by the formality and the homogeneity of the nation state. So they say often, we lived with Christians, Greeks and Armenians in the same neighborhood. We shared our daily lives with them. I learned some Greek when I was a child. I went to churches for weddings and I became familiar with Orthodox rituals. This is a familiar space for me, okay? Second, we find that robust religious identity attachments do not deter participation. In this space, each devotee is aware of the other's religion. Muslims clearly express their Muslim identity. They're not there to convert. They are there to partake in the bounty of Christian saints, in the relief offered by the holy water, and the assistance extended by the priests who navigate the masses with care and attention. Their identities are, are solid. Um, even those who turn out to be secular, atheist, deist, they will say right away, let me clarify, I'm a Muslim. Coming to the shrine, they carry on as individuals not as part of a religious community. They cross the boundary as individual level, uh, as an individual rather than a communal phenomenon. Um, and what is interesting, what is also interesting is that when you start talking about friends, networks, ancestors, this identity becomes a little bit more blurred. It becomes less strict, it becomes textured. And they admit to, to cross identities and all kinds of things. Thirdly, practices of interreligious cooperation become very clear after prayer spaces, after the prayers, in spaces where people offer advice, friendships get started, help is provided, people offer their skills to others. And again, talk about komshuluk, which is a sense of good neighborliness. People bring gifts, bread, cookies, goods to distribute to the poorer members of the church. So older people especially rely on this quick community for emotional and other forms of support. People derive social and emotional support from the practice and the community. When social relations are built, the interne internal sorry, networks of the church start expanding beyond that space knowledge of the social and emotional goods spreads beyond the confine of the space. So people start talking about it and more people come. Fourth, presence in the space is facilitated by the fact that shared sacred shrines are semantically multivocal. And what I mean by that is that as a colleague of mine says, sem semantic multivocality allows multiple users to maintain relations 
with a site that is central to their local or religious identity without over-determining the site or rendering it fixed and unavailable to contradictory uses and interpretations. So by leaving the identity of the site a little bit supple, they can perform rituals as they would in their own religions or in mimicry of others. So often they will say, this is the house of God. I can pray in here as a Muslim and make a Muslim prayer, or I can, or I can uh, imitate Christians and do what Christians do. And in both ways, I feel accepted. So there is then this kind of flexibility of the site, the multivocality of the site. There's a freer, more discontinuous, more responsive to individual intentions. People feel comfortable in this uh, place. And often in here, in these spaces, the charisma of the priest or the rabbi or the Sufi sheikh, the Baraka, the spiritual blessing that comes from by is mediated through the priest uh, or the local share. Fifth, narratives promote sharing and visiting sites and tolerance of the other. People tell stories, and that's another, in a sense, part of the work that I do. I collect these stories. They tell stories of sharing at these sites. They provide examples of miracles, the health benefits of the sacred water, the emotional benefits of returning to pray every week, encountering friends, so that the practice and the relations feed the narratives of well-being and community. Finally, six, at a different but related context of participation, contemporary politics and narratives of claim making are very important in a manner that reminds us of Michel de Certeau's analysis of everyday forms of resistance. People engage in practices of sharing, some trying to subtly subvert, others affirming their understanding of the system. This is especially a response of the secular middle to upper class participants for whom sharing is a rebellious response to the sunification of Turkey. Again, remembering the multi-ethnic past, reproducing a multicultural setting through involvement is a way to oppose the policies of the AKP. So there is this kind of claim making bottom up that happens in these places. So to finish, it's practice, it's narratives and relations, and I think not as much identity. The benefits uh, of such participation in the sacred spaces and rituals of the other are not about a strong sense of belonging and full membership in the space. It is about spreading a message of community, similarity of experience, and the expansion of ties at local levels. Members of different faiths who encounter each other in shared shrines not only seem to relate to each other in further occasions outside the shrine, but also create uh, weak ties that extend further than strong ties and bind different communities together. Ultimately, the belonging and othering in these cases has also to be, has needs to be considered in the larger national context, obviously, uh, because especially in the case of, for example, of Turkey with the rise of Islamic politics, the visitation of Muslims to Christian and Jewish sized, uh, sites has not appeased, in a sense, the larger politics of Sunni dominance. Uh, so uh, these things happen, these events and these, this sharing happens in local shrines and have an impact that is beyond the shrine, but their impact upon the larger community, the national context is still not, in a sense, clarified. Um, it's not really as Im important yet. 
So I would take from this the question that of underemphasizing boundary, uh, sorry, uh, uh, identities, but uh, emphasizing also the crossing of boundaries as individuals. And I think that lowers this identity issue a little bit because it's an individual participation rather than a communal participation. It's not uh, communities that come together. Individuals come, they create community. The process is, separate, is uh, uh, the, the opposite in a sense. Um, and also to finish, I should say, nobody who goes to these places in all of these sites that I have mentioned, um, go meaning to convert or being scared of conversion. It means for them that you are acknowledging that there are different ways of conciliating supernatural forces. And I think I should end here so that it's not too long. Um, I went very fast through the um, examples, but hopefully it gives you a flavor of the issues uh, in this, uh, in this uh, question. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Barkey. That was fascinating. And I was just really struck by um, so many things. But before I get to my questions, I just want to remind our audience who's here uh, that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, box below and we'll make sure that we get to them. And we have a really diverse audience here, including people from as far away as Afghanistan who are uh, with us here. Um, so, you know, just a question that, that comes to mind, and I, I have several as I was watching um, your presentation. One is, is there something unique about frontier areas in terms of, of the sharing sites that you see? I mean, you were, you're very careful not to say that this, these are not syncretic pr uh, processes, but they're almost, they almost look like uh, something that's syncretic. Is there something unique about frontiers? Um, that allows this kind of sharing to happen? Would we expect to see this in sort of core territories or do we see this? Yeah. And then another question that's sort of related to that is, you know, picking up on the patterns that you've observed, I'm wondering what are, um, you know, you mentioned that these, th these patterns are shared over time and that they evolve and they're inherited and people learn to participate in them because that's the process uh, through which you know, they, they have inherited. It becomes a tradition, right, that has evolved. But I'm also wondering if these traditions can be renegotiated over time. And that if individuals, if individuals and their communities renegotiate these, uh, these sharing processes and what those rules look like you know, because at, at our governance center, we're really interested in trying to understand those rules, right? That help us um, uh, that explain why you see this peaceful coexistence, the sharing of sites in certain areas and not in others. And, um, you know, if you could say a little bit about what kinds of uh, practices, why you see these rules emerge in some cases over other than others. Okay. Um... Okay, so the reason why, uh, very much why I wanted to put a little bit, even if it was two minutes of history in there, is that I wanted to emphasize the fact that frontiers and the places where different populations come into contact with each other and are forced by the nature of the place to interact and to find ways to coexist are places where these flourish. So when you think, for example, of the Ottoman movement into the Balkans, as they conquer and they expand the, con uh, the frontier into the Byzantine territories, they encounter more and more Christian territories and Christian people. And they settle, the Sufi, especially the Sufi Shays, settle among these people and uh, 
the relationship evolves and the sharing evolves from that frontier region. Now that frontier region ends up as the map shows, the frontiers have many, many spaces, the many shared spaces, especially in the Balkans. It's full of these shared sanctuaries. But when the national boundaries get, get remade, these frontier areas also become core areas. And that's when, that's linked to your second question, really. That's when rene renegotiation has to happen for survival of these spaces because they suddenly become, you know, much closer to the public authorities, whether it's secular public authorities in the state or religious public authorities. So once you're at the center of everything, uh, at the capital in Istanbul, etc., you have to adapt and you have to make new rules in order to, to keep your um, the space and the sharing. And what are these new rules? What has happened over time is that, in a sense, closures has emerged. Uh, make sure that the site is maintained to make sure that the site is under the radar, that if it becomes too public, if it's written in newspapers, that, you know, they close it down for a while, that pressure will go down, you know, that people who are not, um, uh, that don't look of, that look might maybe potentially dangerous or, or problematic are not accepted into. So one big renego renegotiation is that the much more open, uh, loose, uh, one sheikh or one rabbi or whatever uh, kind of organizational pattern of the space gets consolidated a little bit with internal management. And one of these churches, St. Dimitrios in Istanbul, it was very clear, you know, there was a, a person completely in charge of regulating uh, the, the, the process, the entrance, the exit, everything. So that's one thing. And then there is a kind of internal you know, rule about not talking, you know, when people talk about politics, how much the politics gets, um, uh, you know, that it doesn't ratchet up, it doesn't become conflictual. Again, people, there's always ways of, okay, we're not going to talk about this. Let's move on to you know, this tradition that we used to do or conversation changing is continually uh, a negotiation process because people are trying to bring things from the outside world and that's uh, brought down. So these kinds of issues and these kinds of rules um, uh, become important. In Sveti Nikola, for example, a rich uh, Macedonian who came back from the US bought a big cross and brought it and they put it at to the outside door on top of the door and that created conflict. So right away the community, the elders of the community got together and they decided that the, uh, that the uh, cross had to go. Um, you know, so there is this kind of continual community negotiation that goes on. There is no rule. If there are rules, the state puts, you know, rules for the space. You cannot do this, you cannot do that. They kind of come up with rules. But internally, it's about calming. If we work together like this for a long time. Let it be like this kind of situation. Right, and I was actually reminded, uh, of course, of the, the famous case of Hagia Sophia, right, in, uh, in Istanbul, which is sort of, has ca captured so much public attention because the state 
really has sought to intrude on this yeah. negotiation, right? So that would sort of be an example. Exactly. And actually the Ottoman state, when it converted Hagia Sophia, the church into a mosque was a lot more tolerant of the use of space by Christians, et cetera, and opened it than, than the contemporary, very nationalistic, very religious government. It's interesting. And that actually takes us right into our next question, which comes from Dipali. Um, and she says, your model of interaction and coexistence reveals sites and spaces where flexibility and heteroxy offer possibilities for accommodation. There's a kind of confidence in one's faith that is required to be open to these accommodations. So what happens when orthodoxy and extremism intrude upon these sites and impose their insecurities? And how can these sites reclaim their power in the face of these threats? And she's thinking obviously of the case of Afghanistan here. Yes. So first of all, I, I need to preface this by saying that the cases that I have studied are cases that have not been subject to, um, to uh, or intrusion by extremist forces. The only, in all of the ones I showed you is the synagogue of Jerba in Tunisia, where uh, about 10 years from now, there was a terrorist incident by uh, fundamentalist, uh, fundamentalist, local fundamentalist movement. And what happened as a result was that the state right away interfered to rebuild, uh, put policemen, uh, controlled the situation by, you know, by again, making sure that the space was available. So um, there hasn't, so my cases don't have this kind of extremist intervention, partly because they are not central sites. They are not, you know, Hagia Sophia. They are not um, uh, the, the Jerusalem, uh, how could I forget? What's the name of the, the Temple Mount? That it's not those very politicized sites. So there is no need to, in a sense, they don't get, um, uh, they don't get affected by this. There are two kinds of extremism, in a sense, that have an effect on these sites. One is when the state interferes, uh, and. Um, the state can have a very strong religious ideology and try to mold the site for its own benefits and privilege one group over the others. Uh, that's one scenario. And clearly, for example, in the case of Mount, uh, Mount Tem Temple Mount, this is the, right now it's the Israeli state that has much more of an influence on it. So, and then there is extremist movements from, from outside the state purview that, that also, and they've created a lot of damage, but I'm not sure that internal negotiations, what I work on really uh, are a defense towards, um, uh, towards extremism. The thing that they do, which is really positive, is that they create moral, what I've called moral narratives of a better past when we used to get along. And that's the kind of narrative that spreads that is a counter narrative to religious hatred. But I don't know that internally these spaces have mechanisms against extremists. They don't think of extremism. They don't come up to that, really. I'm and sorry, Dipali. <laughs> <laughs> but I also imagine that they're the, that's why they're the target for extremists, right? Is because they serve as this sort of counterexample, could, could serve as yeah. a target for extremists, right? Because they represent something that may not be as pure um, 
Yes. And they present a very different kind of narrative. And I'm just you know, thinking once again about you know, Afghanistan and Central Asia, where you have this dynamic where you have the state you know, intrudes uh, upon these local dynamics, dis disrupts equilibria, but often these local equilibria are not so strong to be able to withstand, you know, strong men from the outside, nice. insurgents yeah. and that kinds of thing. But they've been, they represent this kind of equilibrium that is stable over time. They gets disrupted, shaken up, and then, you know, yeah. these external actors move on and the equilibrium emerges, um, okay. we yeah. hope, right? Yeah. Um, what is really interesting in the, in the case of Turkey is that despite this kind of Sunni fundamentalist discourse of the Turkish state, they are keen on protecting these spaces because there are two things really happening. Partly it's, the, it's their international image of a tolerant state, which they keep on saying. But the other thing is that the Muslims the religious Muslims who go to these sites are their own constituency. So the, the, in a sense, the ambiguity here comes from the fact that, you know, if they close that site, they would make their own constituents unhappy. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting twist. Interesting. You know, and, and just thinking about these issues, these issues of tolerance, um, you know, when we started this project here at, at Pitt, you know, this was about something much larger. Uh, it was about global issues. And then we saw what was happening here in the United States and our project about peaceful coexistence and toleration suddenly became much more relevant. Um, you know, thinking about voices on all sides of our spectrums. Yeah. You know, it's not just one side of it. We see this challenges from all sides. And I'm wondering, if you could share any uh, share any lessons for us, I know I don't want to extend you too much beyond your empirical domain in um, the Eastern Mediterranean. But what kind of lessons uh, do you think that your work over so many years has for those of us who are really grappling with these issues here in the U.S.? So there, there are political lessons first, and the political lesson for me is that at the level of politics, at the level of state policies, we have to be a lot more, there's an example showing, you know, giving the example of being, you know, much more tolerant, much more, the discourse of politicians makes a big difference. And we certainly saw that with Trump, uh, that, you know, if you preach, hatred, you get hatred in a sense. So that, that level, and the Ottomans understood that very well. They understood that they had to preach diversity for things to work out. So the, the more we preach about diversity at the political level, that's very important. The second to me, what was really interesting was the fact that you know, I realized, and I think it was Gandhi who said that, you know, in order to respect somebody who is deeply religious on the other side, it, you have to be deep, you know, you have to believe deeply, only deeply religious. Be it's not about thin religion, it's about thick religion. That in fact, really people who are believers um, and have this in them can also be respectful. So uh, in a sense, I came into this as a much more secularism will be the solution to this. But in fact, I understand that now identity and deep religious belief is not a hindrance to coexistence. It's in fact, maybe a positive tool, okay? And also related to that, uh, that crossing boundaries um, is, very, uh, is very important, the ability to cross boundaries. We make rules, but rules sometimes can be, need to be more flexible and allow for crossings. And I started even in the last book when I was writing about imperial institutional flexibility, I realized that Ottomans made rules, but in practice, they let things 
be a little more loose than they were more flexible about institutionalizing everything. And that made me feel that boundaries sh should be, can be crossed. It's just that you don't want to lose, people are scared of losing their own identity, their faith, etc. If you can cross a boundary without losing what you have, and I don't know how to translate into modern American politics that, but that's very important. And I wanna think about that more analytically in a sense. How do we cross boundaries? What does that mean? What it, social boundaries are very important. So that I think is, is what I would say. Well, and that's fascinating because it's very counterintuitive, as you suggested, that this assumption that secularism would yield more tolerance. But on the other hand, you find that those who are really deeply religious um, have no problem with toleration and it might actually support uh, toleration. toleration. And I'm just wondering if is, you know, what is the, the causal mechanism at work here? Is it, uh, you know, is it empathy, right? So does religion um, and, and belief uh, and yeah. spiritual belief yield empathy is, is sort of one. Exactly. It's the emotion. It's the empathy. It's the, it's the understanding of the other's position. It's putting your shoes. So a secular person has a much harder time understanding a deeply religious person. And by the way, I'm not arguing against a larger model of secularism. I'm just, I'm just saying secularism negated, in a sense, religious par participation, religious belief. It was just something you hid. We have to deal with it, but we also need to see that it can be very positive. And in each of these Abrahamic religions and also in other religions, you find incredibly positive messages. It's about taking those messages rather than the ones that are used by extremists and making those public. Right, so that's it's fascinating and, and so counterintuitive and we've just hit the one hour mark. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna thank you for joining us, Professor Barkey, this was fascinating. Um, we were just so grateful for the time that you've taken to be with us today. Um, thank yeah, you. And we hope to continue this somehow, some way, shape or form. And if any of you, um, we have more requests coming in for productive discussion and um, wants to talk more about religious toleration. So uh, lots of requests coming in from, from our audience. So thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you, Professor Barkey. You, really Jennifer, grateful for your time. Thank really you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. <laughs>